typically work on four. It seems to me like the best care. And it's equal or less money, so it's a value for me. Get a free brake inspection and brake pads installed for just $49.95 after rebates when you use the Ford Service credit card. Who doesn't, Who doesn't enjoy value? enjoy value? <laughs> Get ready. Anthony Bourdain brings his taste for adventure to CNN. Things are going to get very interesting. New show, No Boundaries. Ah, uh, this I must have. Fruit in this country. Excellent. <laughs> Journey into the unexpected. Wow. With Bourdain's three rules to travel by. Get hungry. Spicy, sour, salty, savory. Get curious. Are you kidding me? Get lost. Mama didn't raise no fools. Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown. Begins Sunday, April 14th at 9 p.m. Only on CNN. At the heart of this trial, of the AEG trial, it's a simple question. Were you an AEG employee, someone they had a responsibility for, or were you an employee of Michael Jackson? Can you answer that question? I don't want Dr. Murray to answer mm -hmm. that. Okay. No, I cannot. Not at this time. Okay, I understand that. D can, I, can I ask you, do you, know, I mean, do you know the answer to that question? Absolutely. Anderson Cooper just a few minutes ago talking to Conrad Murray and asking him the key question, who hired him? Murray's lawyer wouldn't let him answer, but the Jackson family is suing concert promoter AEG, saying the company is to blame for hiring Murray in the first place. We're well, joining me now a man who knows Michael Jackson pretty well better than most people, Thomas Merzero, who represented him, of course, during his molestation trial. Uh, Tom, a uh, fascinating interview that he had there with Anderson Cooper. What did you make of it? And in particular, that first clip there, which I guess is to the key of all this, who was employing Conrad Murray to be a practitioner for Michael Jackson? Well, there's no question in my mind, Piers, that the concert promoter employed Conrad Murray. Michael Jackson may have introduced Murray to them, but they had their lawyers draft an employment agreement. They sent that agreement to Murray to sign. He signed it. Apparently, there's email correspondence where they're admitting that they have employed him, and I think they're going to have a tough time getting out of that position. How will that affect the litigation that's about to start tomorrow with the family led by Michael's mother suing for 40 billion. How will that affect that if you assume that what you've just said is correct, which I which I, I concur with? I don't think this Conrad Murray interview is going to affect that case at all. I think everyone knows that Murray was incompetent. He was convicted of criminal negligence. He caused the death of Michael Jackson. The question is, was AEG, the concert promoter, also negligent? And they can't just hide behind Conrad Murray. I think there's an email trail where they're taking responsibility for hiring him. They're instructing him what to do. They're reminding him that they pay him his money. I think they're going to have a tough time. I think Catherine and the kids have a strong case. This isn't another, another clip. This is where he talks about propofol, which was, of course, the, the killer drug. Yes, indeed. I did order propofol to his home, but I was not the one that brought propofol into his home. I met him with his own stash. I did not agree with Michael. But Michael felt that, you know, it was not an issue because he had been exposed to it for years and he knew exactly how things worked. And um, given the situation at the time, it was my approach to try to get him off of it. I never knew he was an addict. He was going to Dr. Klein's office and being loaded up with humongous, you know, uh, levels of, of, of Demerol. I know you're talking and about... That was his addiction. And basically, this that is probably was what was causing his insomnia and... Because that's a huge side effect. I mean, you hear, you know, I listened to Comrade Murray when he came out. He didn't obviously testify in his case, but he then uh, gave an interview to the Today Show at the time. And it's sort of more of the same, I guess. Very much, look, you can't blame me, you know. But in the end, he was the doctor who was being paid to care personally for Michael Jackson. It all comes down to him, doesn't it, in the end? Well, not all of it. He is the doctor that treated Michael Jackson. He's responsible for his death. The question is, should AEG, the concert promoter, have hired him? Should they have supervised him properly? And did they have enough information to know that he was a danger to Michael Jackson? Should they have fired him? There are three theories the plaintiffs uh, are relying on. They're saying that they negligently hired him, they negligently supervised him, and they negligently... Negligent excuse me, negligently kept him around. Three different theories. Uh, they had agreed to provide medical equipment. Murray actually had asked for 
a CPR equipment, portable equipment. He asked for a gurney. He wanted saline. He wanted syringes. They agreed to provide this equipment to him and apparently never did. So I think the negligent supervision issue and negligent, negligently keeping him on when it was obvious he was deficient and they had problems with him, I think that's going to be a big hurdle for the defendants to overcome. I've got uh, two clips to play. This is from uh, interviews with Jermaine Jackson and then Latoya Jackson, both talking about the people around Michael Jackson, including from AAG. Listen to these uh, back to back. First Jermaine, then Latoya. They were only concerned about the show, moving the show forward. These are people working for AEG? These are people working for AEG, working for him, working for the show. They controlled everything that he did, the people that were around him. They knew he wasn't healthy enough to do those shows, but yet they said he was fine. He was fine. Now, when you hear the family talk about that, not entirely surprising, but certainly a familiar pattern. They've all, from uh, Michael's father to his mother to the uh, siblings, all repeating this same pattern about how they believed all these people were around Michael, forcing him against his health, really, to do this tour. How significant would any of that be when this trial starts? It could be very significant. Apparently there are emails from his choreographer, Ken Ortega, warning AEG that he's not, he's not well, he has serious physical problems, serious psychological and emotional problems. He's asking for professional help. And I'm informed that there are some emails from AEG basically telling Murray, you better get him to rehearsals. So I think this issue is, is well-founded by the siblings, and I think it's going to be a big issue for the plaintiffs. And I think AEG is going to have a tough time explaining it. AEG's uh, lawyer, Marvin Putnam, said it was the 2005 child, child molestation trial, which you were obviously involved with, it caused Michael to dramatically increase his drug use. Do you think there's any truth in that? Uh, I really don't. Now, I was his lead criminal defense counsel in that trial. I talked to him throughout the trial. He was lucid, he was articulate, he was cooperative. I never had a problem working with Michael. Uh, my co-counsel, Susan, you and I both thought he was one of the nicest clients we ever represented. And I did not see drug use as a problem during the trial. Now, the verdict day, he didn't look well. I will say that. He'd been through over five months of trial, all the stress and strain. We were in court five days a week. And I do think that he, had, he suffered physically and emotionally during the trial, but I never saw him take a prescription drug. It would not have been unusual if he had, because people in situations like that are sleep deprived, they're depressed, they have anxiety. If he did take something, it would not have surprised me and it would not have been abnormal. But he never was a problem for us when it came to talking to him, getting information from him, uh, telling him what was going on. He was a delightful client to represent. There's a, uh, one of the emails that you alluded to is from AEG Live CEO or co-CEO Paul Gongleware, which says we want to remind Murray that it's AEG, not MJ, who is paying his salary. We want to remind him what is expected of him. Quite explicit, that really there, you would think, in terms of who's responsible. I suppose on the flip side, Michael Jackson was a very well-known, uh, highly temperamental pop superstar, prone to cancelling concerts, having a variety of health issues of... Uh, the various types of severity, unpredictable, all those things, like many pop artists, could that work against the family's claim in the sense that AG may say, look, yeah, we did try and get him to work, but he was a bit flaky. Well, if they thought he was that flaky and they thought he was that disturbed, why did they enter into a contract with him to do all these concerts? They invested over $30 million before the concerts even began. If they thought he was that bad and they thought his reputation was, that, was suffering from all these other issues, why in the world did they go into business with him? I think it's an uphill battle for AEG. Let's just play the final clip from the Anderson interview, a quite extraordinary moment when Conrad Murray burst into song. You know what describes me, Anderson? Let me sing something for you. This is important to me. He's a little boy that Santa Claus forgot. And goodness knows he did not want a lot. He wrote a note to Santa for some crayons and a toy. It broke his little heart when he found Santa hadn't come. In the streets he envied all those lucky boys. But goodness knows he didn't want a lot. I'm so sorry for that laddie who hasn't got a daddy. I mean, it's almost comical on one level that you can quite see why he didn't testify, because clearly I suspect his legal team weren't entirely sure how he would behave on the stand. But when you hear Conrad Murray behave like that, that's not the behaviour of a... as he would pit himself to us as being of a decent, honourable, straightforward physician, is it? 
No, he has never taken responsibility for what he did. He has always blamed Michael Jackson for everything that's happened to him. He wasn't professional. He violated medical ethics. When the paramedics came to the scene, they asked him, what did you give him? He never mentioned propofol. There was evidence that he tried to hide propofol from the paramedics and the police. He can't get out of this. He's responsible for his death. Uh, AEG should not have retained him. They should have checked him out beforehand. And if they had any problem with him, uh, they should have gotten rid of him. Uh, no, he, he's not a good doctor. He shouldn't be a doctor. And I think he's where he belongs. Final question, and very quick, if you don't mind. Is she, is she going to win, Catherine Jackson, on, the, on behalf of the family? She and the children are going to win, in my opinion. They have a very strong case. They have a great lawyer, Brian Panish, the best in Los Angeles for a case like this. And I think they have the evidence on their side, and I think they have morality on their side. So I think the defendants have a tough go. Tom, great to see you, as always. Please come back soon. Thank you very much, Pierce. Tom Mesero, can't think of a better guy to talk, talk to about Michael Jackson. Coming up, why the NRA point man who unveiled the plan to put guns in America's schools says he's in favor of expanding background checks. It's not what you think. It's a phoenix with four wheels. It's a hawk with night vision.